Hello and welcome to Faith and Friends. The first full week of June is here. My flowers are planted. I'm trusting your flowers are planted too. They're not not planted. <laughs> they stay in the ground, right? The plants, they die over the winter and then they come back. Some Perennials do. do. Yes, yeah. some do. We like yeah. to call those weeds at our house. <laughs> weeds are simply in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs> I think, you know, some of those beautiful wildflowers, which you're calling weeds, are great. Well, thank you. And we saw the health benefits of dandelions just a few weeks exactly. ago. Exactly. Yeah, so we are living very <laughs> fruitfully, apparently. <laughs> well, speaking of fruitfulness, June carries many serious and important holidays. But here in Faith and Friends, we like to look for the unusual <laughs> holidays of the month. So I'm wondering, guys, how are you going to celebrate <laughs> Sorghum Month? It's Sorghum Month this month. Is that a word? Go to the south and have some sweetener. You can get sorghum right here. I think I even have some in my freezer. It's more of a southern thing, but uh, sure, there's parts of southern Allen County, I guess, you can get it. <laughs> All right, Faith and Friends Road Trip. You know what trip. sorghum is? Because I don't. <laughs> hey, this week is International Clothesline Seriously, Week. Seriously, what is it? Sugar? It's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a. It's a grain yes. that can be used as a sweetener. Okay, thank you. There you go. So you can plant it. And amongst there you my go. weeds. All right. Hey, June 7th is VCR Day. All right. Don't forget that one. We I've one. got some great tapes. I'm going to watch that day then. <laughs> do you have a VCR to I, watch I them I do on? have a working VCR, thanks to our engineer here at the station. <laughs> <laughs> and June 10th is Ballpoint Pen Day. What an important... Mm. I'm sure you're planning for that. You're just a or fountain of knowledge. Or maybe you missed it, depending on when you? you're watching this show. <laughs> is that considered a ballpoint pen or just a regular point pen? That would be a ballpoint pen. I'm all, see, I'm celebrating. Early. I'm, I'm set. And all We're late. You know, this show also it will air after Ballpoint Pen Day. So. I think every day is Ballpoint <laughs> Pen Day. But on a more serious note, today's show brings us part two of our series on marriage. This week's topic, boundaries, knowing what to set and how to keep them. Also today, an inspiring story about a recent Perry graduate who excelled in sports despite being hearing impaired. And fourth districtman, District Congressman Jim Jordan is in studio today. But first, our scripture, which aligns itself to our faith challenge top of, topic of the month, brotherly kindness. Andy? First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling, or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Lots packed into that verse, but it's all, or that passage, but it's all for our benefit, for our healthy living, how we treat one another, and how that then will be treated many times by, by some of those same people. Mm -hmm. Brotherly kindness will continue to be our focus, and it first causes us to think about how we personally are acting. How are we reacting? Are we stepping out and doing things for others that's, that maybe they don't, they're not asking us to do? Mm -hmm. We are providing a service opportunity, and as the scripture reminds us, there's a lot of benefit for us as well to be able to do that. Well, a good attitude in all things as an attribute of brotherly kindness, it is. And 2016 Perry High School graduate lives the definition of that. Wesley Godfrey lost his hearing very early in life, but as Matt Finkel reports, being hearing impaired hasn't stopped Godfrey from finding success in sports and in life. I, I got military, I lost my hearing at s seven months old. I was just a baby. And then um, I've been here and here since two, two years old. Of course, I was involved with deaf culture and sign language. At the age of two, Godfrey got a cochlear implant, so he doesn't rely solely on sign language. If there's a lot of people around, it's hard to hear, but when it's quiet like this, it's easy to hear. To pick up the sounds and the different tones, the communication, and you have to talk a lot, do a lot of spirit thinking. While some might get discouraged by a hearing disability, Wes has taken the opposite approach. Let's give you a whole block for me. He's made it a positive in his life, and he's made it, uh, he actually works harder because of his disability. And, and I just think he is who he is because of his disability. If I know I can do it, I can do it. I, I've never seen myself 
Oh, I can't do it. I'm deaf. No, no. I, I just know I can do it. Let me do it. Every night at practice, uh, he's our hardest worker, and he's always encouraging everyone else. Uh, he's a leader. He's captain of our team. Godfrey's high school career has been full of memorable moments, like helping the basketball team claim its first ever district title last winter. Wes also holds a school record in the 1600 on the track, and he just finished out his senior season running in the 400, 800, 4x200 relay, and 4x800 relay. It's very both race, like you had to both race. And like if you're on 4x4 or 4x2, you have a team that depends on you, and then they want you to do your best. So if you do your best, that's all you can do. When you get Wes on the track, He's 100% all the time. So he's automatically in fifth gear right away, bam, as hard as he can go. And at the end of every practice, he will go by and shake the hand of every assistant coach I have and then, of course, my hand. But every night since seventh grade, he's shaking our hands to end the practice and thanked us. Wes's athletic accomplishments are impressive, but it's the way he carries himself off the field that has made him an inspiration. Just a young man of integrity, follows the Bible. Hey, we don't form a line. Doesn't miss church and is just a great role model. I want to be working in, in construction is that um, I, I've been talking to a lot of people, so I've been, so it helps me to move in. And like with me making friends with other hearing people um, helps me make it easier. A lot of coaches are role models for their players. He's my role model. <laughs> He's a role model for me. He makes me want to be a better person. He wants me to be a better coach, a better Christian. He, he's the, the, the type of a kid that you only get once in a lifetime, and uh, I'm glad that I've had the last five years to spend with him. With the Commodores, I'm Matt Finkel. Thank you, Matt. What an excellent story. Well, 4th District Congressman Jim Jordan is joining us now here in the studio. And if you follow Faith and Friends very closely, you'll notice that we really don't talk politics very much here on the show. We're a lot more into food and fun and encouraging you through the scripture. But we do encourage you often to pray for your political um, officials as well as for the government in general. And so, Congressman Jordan, thank you so much for joining us My here pleasure. at TV 44. And before we get started talking about the stuff that's, that's taking place in Washington, mm -hmm. how can our viewers be praying for you and for Washington, for the government in general? Well, um, well we certainly appreciate uh, the, the folks who pray for us. Uh, sometimes I'll be out and about and we'll hear people come up to us, you know, our, our family prays for you. And, and um, that is just always encouraging to hear. Um, but the main thing I would say is what, what I'm sure you do and what so many Christians are doing, just pray for the country. It's a critical, um, troubling time, I think, in, the, in, the, in, in our nation. You think about the foreign policy concerns, the threat of terrorism, our fiscal problems. But probably more importantly is just the cultural concerns we see out there. Basic principles, basic values, that um, we have accepted and believed in and that we think have served the country so well and served Americans and people and Christians so well uh, are under attack. And so I would say just pray for all that. Um, for me specifically, um, I always talk about my, my favorite scripture verse is 2 Timothy 4, 7, where Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, fight the good fight, finish the course, keep the faith. And so um, just pray that, that we as Christians will you know, put that verse into practice. Mm -hmm. Fight the fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. And do it in, a, in, a, in the right way, with a smile on our face, but, but do it and, and, and live by it if we can. Nine and a half years, we were talking before we yeah. started here, you've been a congressman for nine Long and time. a half years. So you've <laughs> seen a lot of change, uh, both in our country and in, mm -hmm. our, our, in Washington, D.C. Um, you were here a couple weeks ago talking about welfare reform mm -hmm. and the Upward Mobility Act. Yeah. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk with you when you were in Lima then. People may have saw the uh, Lima News or watched NWLIO, right. right. but, but um, you're pretty passionate about this, about this issue. Well, this is, yeah, we think this is important. You, you know, look at the growth in food stamps, for example. Uh, when President Obama took office, almost eight years ago, we had 17 million Americans on what's called the SNAP program, the food stamp program. Mm -hmm. Today, it's almost 47 million Americans. So huge growth in just that one social welfare uh, program. Uh, we think that there are better ways to help people uh, where we actually incentivize work. And so the bill we've introduced specifically with the food stamp program, we say, look, if you're an able-bodied adult, so that 47 million uh, Americans, there are a significant number who are single, able-bodied adults, no dependents, 
we said, look, you, you should have some kind of work requirement uh, before you get help from the taxpayer. We think that having that is treating taxpayers with the respect they deserve, but more importantly is going to help those individuals who maybe sort of get stuck in the system, trapped in the system, and kind of dependent on government. We think it's going to give them sort of the tough love push they need to get to a better position in life. Um, and we should have that, frankly, that concept throughout our social safety net systems. We have 79 different means-tested social welfare programs with the federal government. Um, we think it's better to try to combine those and incentivize work. And, I, and I, I tell folks all the time, think about some of the first jobs you had, probably making not a whole lot of money, but how you learn principles and values and lessons in those jobs that help you get to a better position mm -hmm. later in life. I would imagine that many of the people listening at home would agree with what you're saying, that yeah, we have an issue, we've got problems, we, we need people to get off their couch yep. and to start working. Yep. Um, but we also are in a transitional year this year, and what is the likelihood of seeing this that you've introduced actually moving through and becoming? Great what? question. It, it, it's probably not going to become law. But you, you want to start the conversation and get things moving in the right direction. We'll see what happens in November uh, with the Congress, with the Senate, with, with, the, um, with the big race for the White House. Um, but the idea is to begin to start laying the groundwork and say, look, let's, let's, let's change this. Some states have done it, particularly the state of Maine. And they found that they, they put in a work requirement for able-bodied singles, uh, you know, no dependents, that um, they found an 80% reduction in that, that population group. And what, what they saw was most people said, well, instead of just doing the work requirement, I'll just go get a job. Imagine mm -hmm. that. And that's good for taxpayers. But I would argue it's good for that individual. It's going to help them get to a better position, move to a better um, better station, better job, better opportunities in the future for them. And that's good for them, their family, and, and, and good for the country. Well, there was an article in the Lima News just recently talking about the number of jobs that exist right here in Allen County. So the jobs are there. Definitely need there to There are opportunities. To, to we we hear it all the time. We hear it all the time from employers. Look, we're, we're, we're trying to hire people. And one of the things that would help us is if the social safety net system wasn't so um, attractive, um, that would be helpful. And we hear it from employers all the time. Yeah. Now you uh, you mentioned Washington. You mentioned the changes. Um, let's just let's just talk politics uh, elections quickly, mm -hmm. because I feel like the voters are kind of sending a message, and um, I'm hearing a lot of people saying this is kind of our message. We are fed up with what we see in government. We're rejecting anybody who's from the system. Yep. What do you think about that? No, it's just the truth. I had I had breakfast. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I guess now maybe now two months ago with Pat Cadell, actually a Democrat strategist, um, but a guy who's kind of fed up with the whole thing himself, even though he's still involved in politics. And he, he mentioned three numbers to me. He said, Jim, remember 70, 60, 80. Seventy percent of uh, the country thinks that our nation's in decline. Uh, Sixty percent say they're better off than their parents, but their children will likely be worse off than them. And 80 percent, to your point, Jennifer, 80 percent said, they believe Washington's completely rigged against them. The town exists to serve the political elite, the big corporations with the big lobbyists, and all the connected people at the expense of regular middle class families. And the reason 80% of America believes that is because it's true. I've been in this town. I've seen where if, if, you, if you have the big lobbyists and the, and the big connections and you're part of some big labor or big, big corporations or, or, or big business, you get to the front of the line. And that's not how it's supposed to work. So we actually put together a group a um, year and a half ago, a group of members we, we called the Freedom Caucus. And our mission statement, we talk about the countless number of families who feel like Washington has forgotten them. Mm -hmm. Our job is to remember them, fight for them, and, and in real simple terms, do what we told them we were going to do when they elected us to go represent them. And that's what we try to do. We try to do it with a smile on our face. But, but there is a frustration out there. We're seeing it, I think, play out both parties in this presidential nominating uh, process we are going through. Well, it's complete on the Republican side. The Democrats are still going through it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a real frustration there. And it's time that we, we just we make it way too complicated. Do what you told the voters you were going to do. If we go do that, I think we'll be all right. So you think that Americans should still have hope? Oh, yeah. Should they, still, uh, oh, yeah. Should they not give up at this point? Never forget, it's, it's America. You know, we got our concerns, we got our problems, and I think they're maybe real and in some ways maybe things we haven't seen before. 
but it's still the best thing going. And we have risen to the occasion every single time. I heard a guy give a speech not too long ago, and he said, it's interesting, every third generation's had to do something big in this country. Started with the founders, and they, they started this experiment in liberty, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, self-government, I mean, amazing, amazing formula they set up. And they had to win against all odds that no one thought they could, taking on Great Britain and, and, and defeating them. Three generations later, Civil War. We had this terrible evil called slavery. There was a war fought over that, and we got rid of it, and we came back together as a country. Three generations later, it was the Great War, the Second World War, and we took on the evils of Nazism and Imperial Japan and everything else, and that generation rose to the occasion. And now here we are three generations later with our own set of big problems, fiscally, terrorism, um, culturally, but I'm confident that Americans will, once again, rise to the occasion, deal with it, and will continue to be the leader of the world. All right, and of course, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan does have a office right here in Lima, so you can find uh, contacts right here if you wanted to ask questions, make comments. There is the address, the phone number, and his website, jordan.house.gov. And we'll be right back after this. The time is now to bring your donations to TV44. We're gearing up for this year's auction, and we need your items now to make it a success. Furniture, collectibles, antiques, tools, vehicles, mowers, anything of value. Drop-offs accepted Monday through Thursday, 10 till 3. Call for Friday hours, 419-339-4444. Donate your items now to the TV44 auction. Well, we're hitting a very important topic today and in the weeks to come, marriage. Whether you are married, you have been married, you might be married, or you know someone who's been married, we've got a bunch of information that we believe God is downloading to you and to all of those you know who are in this situation. I'm thrilled to have David and Tracy Sellers from Vows to Keep joining us as we start a series on marriage. You, When I decided I wanted to have a series on marriage, God just said, you guys are the right people. You're the ones I need to talk to. Before we get into our first topic of boundaries, can you just quickly tell me what is Vows to Keep and what do you do? Sure. Well, Vows to Keep Marriage Ministries is something that we started really out of a calling that we felt God putting in our lives before we were even married. And uh, we were talking about what God was doing, you know, even just a couple of days into really our dating relationship mm -hmm. and felt God leading us to do this. And um, Vows to Keep is, is basically a ministry that's all about helping you to apply the Bible to your marriage uh, and, and the hardships that we go through in marriage. It's so exciting to be talking with couples on a weekly basis, just sitting down with them and counseling with them. We also have a radio program on Shine FM in the Bell Fountain and Marysville area, and we're expanding to Lima and beyond, so that's exciting as well. WTTP, is that yes, right? Yes, right here on WTTV. That's great. Exciting to work with Mike Spalding on that. We do marriage conferences and we do those around the region. We've actually had one here in Lima before. Just getting couples those big bi biblical building blocks that they can build on, go home and start applying God's word to their marriage right then and there. And we also have date nights. We're having a fun one coming up here in just a little bit. Every year we do three specific date nights where we're adding more every year. We do a canoe date, just giving couples time together and so maybe some things to talk about while they float down the Mad River. We also have a ballroom dance date mm -hmm. night and a square dance on New Year's Eve. Lots of fun. All right, that's our that's Vows to Keep in a nutshell, and you can find out more at VowsToKeep.com. But we're going to talk about some important topics today and in the weeks to come, and we're going to start today by talking about boundaries. Boundaries in marriage. Boundaries in marriage. Let's go. Boundaries are something that cause most couples, actually just most people in general, to panic, right? They don't want to be fenced in. They would really prefer that I have the flexibility to set my own destiny. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. And um, I think that when we look at the root of that, in some ways it's actually tied to a sinful nature that we have. We yeah. think we know what's best for us, and we'd really rather to be able to set our own course. So I think when we realize um, how quickly we can get off course um, when we actually get a chance to follow through in our own ways, it's, it's eye-opening. It's really easy to convince ourselves that when we live the way we want, that we're gonna have that ultimate freedom. But that's our sinful nature. And when we find ourselves in that position, just doing what we want with the Bible totally on the side, mm -hmm. then we're held within like this 
grasp of death, and it's a spiritual death, and that's the chains that bind. I think about um, you know, Adam and Eve. They really were the first couple to get a boundary. So God says, you, you've got the whole garden. You can have it all. But there's one boundary that I want you to know about here, and, and it's for their ultimate freedom that he actually gives this boundary to them. It's something that he does out of love for them. God's word has a lot of boundaries that are in it, but again, they're all for ultimately our freedom. And it's something that really results in long-term happiness in our marriages when we get a chance to apply what the Bible says. There's a, a boundary example that I would like to, I guess, talk a little bit about. It's just Ephesians uh, 4.27. It says, for when you're angry, you might give a mighty foothold to the devil. Essentially, we, we can very easily let the enemy into um, the, the boundaries of our marriage, into the unity that we work so hard to build, just by being angry and, and letting basically an opportunity mm -hmm. for that unity to be blasted apart through that. Speaking of those words and that tone, Jennifer, when I am in a heated moment with David, that's when I get out of bounds. That's when I get out of God's word and what he tells me to do because I can say things that later on I want to take back. I can say it in a way that's not kind and compassionate like God's word tells me to be. And especially in the area of disrespect, I think women can get out of bounds really quickly because God's word's really clear in Ephesians to be respectful to our husbands so I can cross over that boundary into disrespect. And that's not where I want to be and that doesn't create unity. How do people know where those boundaries are? How do, how do they figure out how to create that? Our society is not teaching us where those boundaries are. In many yes. ways, they're teaching us the opposite. Oh, opposite. yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing yeah. disaster after disaster. I think you almost just answered your own question because people are learning, they're letting society teach them, but they need to be taught by God's word. Because if you read through even just the book of Ephesians and how it lays out how we should talk to each other, right then and there, you've mm. got it. You've got your boundaries. And if you stay within those, your marriage is gonna be so blessed. There's, amazing. Th th there's a lot of times where you look at, um, you know, some of the boundaries are very practical level, like our jobs. Um, I think it may be a little bit of a generational thing, but, you know, back when my dad was my age, he didn't have a cell phone that kept him connected to his job. When he clocked out and walked away, he, he was done with his job. And ultimately, there was a boundary that allowed him to sort of protect in a way the love time and, and the opportunity that he would have with his family. But that's not really the case now for that's most right. of us. We have a cell phone and therefore there's a, a very loose and oftentimes completely missing boundary. But if we look at God's word, Ecclesiastes 3 says, you know, for, every, for everything there's a season, a time for every activity under heaven. And I think it's important that we do our job well, um, but we really have to have a, a drawn a boundary, uh, something that we can set before God and say, here's a boundary that I'm, I know honors you and then I'm going to share that with my wife to help me stay accountable. I'm going to share that with my employer mm -hmm. and say, you know, this, this is something I want to, I want to please you, uh, but I'm sure you'll respect the fact that I, I need to maintain my family as well. So God's word is a great source. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. More than just say, I'm going to do this. Yes. Finding someone who will keep you accountable or saying this, this is important. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm going to preserve this time. Yeah, it takes yeah. action behind it. And on the technology note, that's another area. God's word doesn't talk about emails, doesn't talk about Facebook, doesn't talk about smartphones, but it does I talk it would about- I bet the Bible was written yes. today. <laughs> <laughs> but it talks about keeping things out in the light, keeping them in the open. And we can do that in that area of technology with our spouse. A lot of people have separate passwords and they're not sure what their husband's is or what their wife's is. But just to be open and honest in your marriage and say, I want you to know, hey, I had to text um, a male teacher today and I just want you to be aware that that text was sent out and at any time I want to feel comfortable with you looking at my Facebook page or looking at my email nothing hidden in the dark mm, nothing hidden so important that's where the boundaries can can be broken so quickly yes. I always you know Satan just needs a crack to start that and then 20 years later a couple says yeah how did we get here yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely little yeah. by little <laughs> So boundaries are such an important thing. Boundaries, though, do you even think that that also is important if you have children? Um, I mean, there's a lot of good things. You can come sure. up with an excuse. Well, I'm just going to my kid's sporting event, or I'm just yes. involved in my church mm -hmm. activity, or I'm just helping out at the soup kitchen thing. That's right, yeah. Time is, is actually one of those things that if you look at, um, you know, we, we have to actually put some boundaries around our mm -hmm. time because um, 
it's very easy to get totally out of whack um, and, and think you've got the right priorities. Uh, I, I oftentimes, as I work with guys, I would say, okay, let's write down what we did yesterday. Let's write down what we did the day before and let's kind of break those into categories and then look to see, do, do our priorities actually reflect how we spent our time? Mm -hmm. uh, so it is very true. We can, get, we can easily get to the point in which we're passionately pursuing things that, um, that really aren't what would protect our marriage and our family ultimately. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us to number our days, to realize our time is short and to spend them well. And speaking of spending, finances are another huge area of boundaries that couples can find themselves out of bounds. When a couple has separate finances, right there, the line has already been drawn. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, I would just encourage listeners and viewers to combine their checking accounts and be united in that. But then as you are, sit down and have that conversation with your spouse. If I'm out shopping and I see something that's $50, should I give you a call? Like what's kind of the spending limit? Are we gonna accept those credit cards that are offered to us everywhere we go? Or are we gonna have no credit cards? And how can we honor God with our finances? Some incredible uh, tips from David and Tracy Sellers of Vows to Keep. We're talking about boundaries in marriage. Everything from things that you would probably think about biblically, but practical things, finances, sending text messages, all of these little things that could create problems. When you can create the proper boundaries, then you can prevent those problems and God can fulfill more things in your marriage. This is just part of our ongoing conversation with David and Tracy. Of course, you can go to their website, vows2keep.com to find out more about all of the services that they offer. Their heart is to restore marriages, even if it is yours. Their heart is to see God supreme in every marriage there is. All right, we look forward to hearing more from David and Tracy in the weeks to come, but for now, we'll head it back to Mark and Andy. Thank you, Jennifer. Next week's topic in our marriage series with Vows to Keep, Are You Asleep at the Wheel? David and Tracy talk with Jennifer about leadership roles and how to recognize when we are not stepping in as God desires. And now as we close, we return to our scripture for this week, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Something to keep in mind throughout this week. Thank you for joining us on Faith and Friends. We'll see you next time.